my generation was more than a little apprehensive about computer processing. You probably are not. But in any case, there's no need to be apprehensive here. We shall not be concerned with computers as such. They will just be tools doing what we tell them. Storing the data, moving it around, doing arithmetic on it. And we'll not be concerned with uh, algorithms and programming languages and all that computer gobbledygook, just seismics. Let's start by going back to the Grand Canyon. You remember this piece from GP-102? So, we make a bang, the Earth trembles, and the tremble travels out in all directions as a seismic wave, reflected in part and transmitted in part at each geological interface. But often for simplicity, we think of it less in terms of waves than in terms of rays. The downgoing and reflected ray for the first reflector, and the second, and the third, and the fourth. And all together, and in real time. So we have the two views of what happens in the Earth, the wave view and the ray view. The wave view and the ray view. Remember, the wave view is what actually happens in the Earth. The ray view is very useful for calculations. Obviously, we need to be rather nimble to catch those echoes. For reflectors this deep, the whole thing is over in about half a second. So we'd better capture the output from the geophone by recording it on tape. Then we can take away the tape and examine it at our leisure. Here's one thing we might do. Let's play back the signal from the tape as a wiggly trace. Let's look at what the geophone heard. There it is. That's what came out of the geophone. The vibration of the ground as a function of time. Again? Let's take the events one at a time. First, this marks the instant when we made the bang. We call it the time break. It's the effective time origin of the recording, the zero time point. Next, the first arrival through the Earth. See where that comes from? Yes, you're right. The bang makes the Earth tremble, and the tremble travels more or less horizontally to the geophone as the first arrival, or the first break. Now, the first arrival tells us absolutely nothing about reflections, and for present purposes, we don't want it. So we mute it, remove it, cut it out. That leaves us the four reflections, the four reflected trembles as a function of reflection time. The reflections get progressively weaker, of course, as they have further to go. Supposing we could remove that effect, that loss of strength with distance traveled, so that this would become this. All reflections now have equal strength. All right, now let's cut out that trace and stick it here. One look at that and you've already guessed what we're going to do next. Yes, move the geophone to here. Make a new bang here at shot point two and play out the geophone signal in the same way. Do it again at shot point three And again at shot point four and so on. You can see what we're doing. Building up a seismic section as a representation of the underlying geologic section. Let's look more closely at this seismic section. Its horizontal scale represents horizontal distance along a line, just like a geologic section, shot point one, two, three, and so on. 
its vertical scale is in seconds of reflection time, down into the Earth and back. Although the seismic section is composed of vertical traces, we can convey the impression of horizontal lines, marking the rock contacts, by the simple trick of blacking in one side of the wiggles. So here is the tremble reflected back from the first rock contact, here from the second, and so on. We are representing the geologic section by the seismic section. Yes, of course you remember all that. And you remember its message, that the object of seismic processing is to make a seismic section as close as possible to a geologic section, to remove all the unwanted artifacts of the seismic method, to remove all noise, to remove the distortions introduced along the path of the seismic wave, and to emerge with a seismic section as close as possible to a geologic section. That is seismic processing. All right, let's do it. In the simplest of all possible cases, the one that we've just seen. First, we set up our processing chart or processing flow diagram, saying what processes we intend to apply and in what order. In this case, mount the tape, select the right traces, mute the direct arrival, the first break, adjust the reflection amplitudes, and display. Mount the tape, easy. And then tell the computer what to do. In this case, first of all, to select the right traces. Which are the ones that give us this progression along the line, from each shot in turn, the signal corresponding to the near group. But what we have on that tape is not only the geophone signal from the near group, but also the geophone signals from all the other groups in the spread. So the instruction we give to the computer is to run quickly through the tape and select from each record only this trace, the output from the near group as the shot and the spread roll along the line. In fact, we probably tell the machine to make us a new tape containing only the near traces. All right, now to the next processing step the mute. If we go back to the field record, which we saw the observer taking in the field, there it is. The near trace, the far trace, the first breaks, and a reflection. Time increasing to the right and the timing lines. Let's take a close look at the near trace alone. Then there is the offending first break, the first arrival the one that tells us nothing about reflections, the one we want to blank out or mute. So we tell the computer, replace everything up to, what shall we say, 200 milliseconds by zero. Muting. In fact, since that might make the start of the signal untidy, we normally tell the computer to ramp the signal on. Or taper it on. Over perhaps 100 milliseconds. This is why, you've probably noticed, seismic sections often seem to start with a whimper rather than a bang. That's the effect of the mute, and then of ramping on. Ah. Uh, or tapering on. Okay. Now what's next on the flowchart? Ah, yes. Adjust the amplitudes. Now the size of the geophone signal, its amplitude, depends on many agencies. Fortunately, the most important of these agencies is also one of the simplest to understand. The signal gets weaker when it travels farther. It gets weaker because the energy in a small piece of the wavefront here later spreads out to cover a larger piece here. The amplitude decays because the wavefront spreads. And so we call this decay of amplitude spreading decay. How large is this decay? Quite large. When we work it out, we find that in a uniform Earth, the wavefront spreads spherically, and the reflection amplitude is inversely proportional to the reflection time. Double the time, half the amplitude. At one-tenth of a second, say 100% amplitude. At one-half a second, the amplitude is down to 20%. At five seconds, down to 2%. The big visual effect we notice is at early times. Right. Now, this decay of reflection amplitude tells us nothing about the geology, 
It's just a consequence of the spreading wave front. So let's remove it, remove the decay. How? Easy. Just tell the machine to multiply each value on the trace by its corresponding time. Double the time, double the multiplier. Good. Simple. I like that. We understand the decay due to spreading. We know what's going on, and so we use our knowledge to remove the effect. This is an example of my favorite kind of processing, deterministic processing. It says, understand the effect we wish to remove, then get the measure of it, and finally use this determined knowledge to remove the effect. You're right, of course. Deterministic processing is best, but often we can't do it. There are too many agencies causing too many effects all at once, and we can't unravel them. Then we have to use statistical processing. It says, don't even ask why or how. Sometimes we don't need to understand the mechanism. Just measure the effect on average, statistically, and then compensate the effect on average. We have an example right here with the amplitudes. Our reflection amplitudes depend on many, many things. Geometrical spreading is the big one. We understand it, so we use deterministic processing. But then there are propagation losses in the Earth, variations in the source from one shot point to another, variations in the sensitivity of the geophone group, and, of course, the reflectors themselves, the information we're finally seeking. All these are rolled in together, and it's not easy to measure each effect separately. So for these, all lumped together, we often use statistical processing. This is what we do. Here is the trace after compensation for spherical spreading. It still shows some decay with time, and very probably it's either stronger or weaker than the near trace from the next shot along the line. We tell the machine to look at this trace through a window. Or a gate. In processing, there are always two words for everything, at least two. This window is wide enough, we usually say long enough, to include many reflections, many wiggles, at least as long as we see here. Then we ask the machine, what is the average amplitude of the trace in this window? The computer will do some sums and say, oh, about 87. Then we say, all right. Now, what would we like it to be? Let's say a nice round number. How about 100? Okay. So this is what we'll do. We'll multiply the trace value at the center of this window, whatever that value is, by 100 over 87. So we make that particular value just a little larger, 100 over 87. Right. Now we slide the window a little way down the trace and do the same thing. Perhaps the average amplitude in the window now is 85 instead of 87. It can't be very different if the window is long. You're just dropping off one value behind and adding one on the front. That's fine. So now we multiply the value at the center of the new window by 100 over 85 to get the new value, and so on, with the window sliding down the trace until the window reaches here. Now the average amplitude in the window is quite small, perhaps only 25. So the value of the original trace at the center of the window is multiplied by 100 over 25, or four times, and so on. The total effect is to balance the average amplitude of the new trace. The average amplitude stays the same right down the trace. But, and this is important, provided the window is fairly long, the process does not much affect the relative amplitudes of adjacent reflections. The relative amplitudes of adjacent reflections. Either early in the trace, where the reflections were originally strong, or later, where the reflections were originally weak. Now, let me see. Does this remove the effect of a weak bang or a weak geophone group? Uh, yes, of course it does, provided we use the same reference number of 100 for every trace, every bang. Correct. So all the final near traces on our tape are totally balanced, both down each trace and from trace to trace. We're ready to display our near trace section. Now, whereas field people look at traces horizontally, processors usually look at them vertically. Now, we can add time zero, which corresponds to the datum plane, and the timing lines, 
For detailed work, we usually use a time scale of 10 centimeters to one second. While for reconnaissance work, where we need to see a lot of line all at once, we often use five centimeters to one second, which is more or less four inches per second and two inches per second. Okay. Now we must identify that trace with a point on the map. A point on the map, say 2438, corresponds accurately to a point on the ground. Let's suppose we drill a hole and fire a shot at that point, 2438, into our spread. But here we're considering only the near group, which must, in practice, have some offset from the shot point. And it's this information, the reflection information, which is carried by the corresponding near trace. So the trace goes here, at the midpoint between shot point and near group. So a trace on the section is not numbered with the number of the shot point from which it came. In this case, where the shot point interval happens to be half the near group offset, the trace from shot point, 2438, is actually labeled shot point 2439. So the number of a trace on the section is not necessarily the same as the number of the shot point from which it came. There is a shift or a setback. This setback is very small, insignificant, when the near group offset is small, but it can be important, and we must put it in if the near trace offset is large. That's right. It is the reflection location on the section which must correspond one-to-one -one with the map, not the shot point location. So there we are, finally, with our near trace section. Not quite. How about this? Ah, yes, of course. We have another decision to make. We can have what we see here, which is called variable area wiggle. Or we can have this, which is just variable area. Me, I like variable area. It gives equal emphasis when the trace swings to the right and when it swings to the left. And it prints well. Yes, but my eyes aren't as young as yours, and all that black and white hurts my astigmatism. I like the variable area wiggle. It's true that it emphasizes only the blacked-in peaks and that the wiggle line often gets lost in the printing. And in the video. Yes, but it's just easier on my eyes. Well, we'll see plenty of both in this series. We'll use them interchangeably. In fact, we've already done so. Our first example of picking was on variable area. And our first example of the need to migrate. Remember that? That was on variable area wiggle. So there it was. I done drilled the hole here, where it should have been here about a mile away. One other thing about display, the horizontal scale. How many traces per centimeter or per inch? A good rule of thumb, and one that the interpreters appreciate, is to keep some simple relationship to the scale of the map. For example, if the vertical scale, the time scale, is 10 centimeters to the second, then the horizontal scale might be 1 to 25,000. And if the vertical scale is 5 centimeters to the second, the horizontal scale might be 1 to 50,000 to keep the proportions the same. The effect of this for typical velocities is to give the section a vertical exaggeration of about 2 to 1. Or a horizontal compression, which is the same thing. Typically, this. We use different degrees of vertical exaggeration for different purposes, just as the geologists do. But what we see here is a good general rule of thumb. Now, to the label, usually down the right-hand side of the section. First, the section identification. Area, line number, shot points. Then the general type of section, in this case, a near trace section, and its direction, east to the right. Next, the label must record the field data, who shot it, and when. The source, in this case, dynamite, in drilled holes. The spread geometry, in this case, the single near group. The geophones, and the array. And the recording instruments, and their settings. Now the processing. Who did it and when? The datum. Then the processing sequence, the equivalent of our processing flow diagram. Select the near traces, mute at 200 milliseconds with a 100 millisecond taper, compensate the spreading decay, and balance the amplitudes with a sliding window one second long. Good. Now the display. 
The vertical scale and the horizontal scale, compatible to give a preferred degree of vertical exaggeration. And for convenience, a horizontal scale bar. Finally, a record of the polarity of the overall system. An upward motion of the geophone case produces a black peak on the final display. We'll find the importance of this later on. One more thing. The signature of the processor responsible for quality control. If there's no signature there, be on your guard. Either no one was responsible, or he wasn't very proud of it. There. That's better. All right. So much for the label. Now, let's look at the section itself. A primitive near-trace section from real life. What do you think? Well, yes, here and there I can see one or two reflections. Fair in a few places, but really not very good. It's only a near-trace section, remember? Very primitive. Yes, I know. But the first thing I see is that there is far more jitter on the reflections, far more unevenness from trace to trace, than could ever be present on real geological layers. You're right, of course. And the first likely reason is datum corrections. Although we listed the datum as sea level, we did not apply any time corrections to bring the reflection times to what they would have been if both shot and geophones had been at the datum level. So we must do that next. Very important. There are many ways to do it, some of them fairly exotic, but let's just listen to two simple solutions. Both, by the way, deterministic solutions. You remember, we always go for deterministic solutions if we can. The surface, the shot point flags, the datum. The shot hole and the geophone group which gives us our near trace section. The shot. The downgoing ray. And the reflected ray from depth. Our object is to correct the reflection time to be that corresponding to both source and geophone on the datum plane. To do that, we must subtract this time, which we call the source static correction, or just the source static, and this time, which we call the receiver static. Okay, now how to do it. First, the surveyor gives us the elevation of the shot point flag above datum, E sub S. Then the shooter, or the driller, gives us the depth of the shot, D sub S. So the source static is the elevation of the shot above datum divided by the velocity of the bedrock between the shot and the datum, which we call V sub E, the elevation velocity. Subtracting this quantity from the reflection time effectively brings the shot down to datum. All right, now the receiver static. The simplest possible case is the situation where bedrock comes virtually all the way to the surface, only a very thin cover of soil. Then. It's easy. The surveyor tells us the elevation of the geophone group above datum, E sub G. And so the receiver static is this elevation divided by the same velocity. Subtracting this quantity from the reflection time effectively brings the geophones down to datum. But in all this, the one quantity we don't know is V sub E, the elevation velocity. For that, we need another device we saw in the field, the uphold geophone. That gives us the uphold time, and the rest is obvious. The depth of the shot, divided by the uphold time, gives us the elevation velocity. Well, that's simple enough. Now, let's go to another type of near surface. This is the common situation where there is a near surface layer which is dry, unconsolidated, aerated, we say weathered, and of a velocity V sub W, the weathering velocity, less than the elevation velocity, V sub E. One situation where this happens is one we discussed before, where there is a water table. Then there can be a very marked increase of velocity from V sub W to V sub E at the top of the water-saturated zone. The problem with this, of course, is that the receiver static now has two parts, the time in the elevation material and the time in the weathering. And the uphold time now does not give us uniquely either the elevation velocity, V sub E, or the weathering velocity, V sub W. Only some unknown mix of the two. So we have a tougher problem. Tough enough that we'll spend a whole module on it later. But for the present, let's just take note of one easy solution. This is possible when the location of the near group for this shot later happens to become a shot point. 
as the recording system rolls along the line. You can see the trick. For the first shot, we need to know this receiver static. But that is substantially equal to the source static of the next shot plus the uphold time of the next shot. This is about equal to this. So now we don't need to compute receiver statics, just compute the source statics and measure the uphold times. And the source statics, provided that the shot is below the weathering, do not need to know the weathering velocity or the depth of the weathering, only the elevation velocity, V sub E. Which we can usually get by other means. All right, so let's do it. Calculate the source statics, measure the uphold times, deduce our total datum correction for each trace, and apply them to the section. Hmm, distinctly better. Now there's less jitter from trace to trace. It looks geologically more plausible. Whenever the reflections look broken or jittery, one of our first suspicions is inadequate datum corrections. It's an example of an observation we make many times in seismics that the body of the Earth is generally well behaved and serves us well. It's the near surface, the top hundred meters or so, which is the pain. Almost all our problems, noise, surface waves, signal loss, rapid variations of weathering, all these occur in that troublesome near surface. <clears throat> Because the near surface is such a problem for us, and because variations in the near surface often produce some sort of irregularity in the surface, we always display at the top of the section an elevation profile of the line, the height of the ground in meters or feet relative to the datum. Then we can see by eye whether some irregularity in a reflection at depth occurs at the same place as some irregularity in the surface, a rock outcrop or a swamp or, remember this one, a steep valley, possibly full of low-velocity fill. Hey, I recognize that. That's my boo-boo up in the North Country. Ouch! Well, you didn't have to remind me of that. Poor Jill. Even if we're lucky enough to get the datum corrections perfect, we still find places where the reflections are jittery from trace to trace. That's our old enemy, noise. You remember we were much concerned about that in the field. It was one of the reasons why we put out an array of geophones rather than a single phone. But even after the best that we can do in the field, there is still some noise left. So let's see what we can do about it in the processing. Once we've left the field, you see, we have no way of knowing whether a particular wiggle on the trace came from a leaf or a passing truck or a genuine reflection. So in processing, we have to make somewhat arbitrary definitions of noise and definitions of signal and work from there. One way is to say that we define signal as that which is common from trace to trace and noise as everything else. Then it follows that the way to improve the signal relative to the noise is to add traces together. In principle, it's the same as adding together the geophones in the group in the field only that now we're adding traces in the processing. Let's see how we could do it on a near trace section. These, we'll say, are the traces of that section. One, two, three, and so on. And let's say that we decide to add three traces to obtain one new trace centered now at trace two. There's no doubt the new trace two has better signal to noise ratio than the old trace two. Then we move along one trace adding the old traces, 2, 3, and 4, to obtain one new trace, 3. Then old traces, 3, 4, and 5, to obtain new trace, 4, and so on. Until, except for the ends, we have one output trace for each input trace. So in this example, we're adding three old traces to obtain one new trace. By this adding, then, each new trace becomes an average of, in this example, the three old traces. A mix, the old-timers used to call it. And the result? The old section unmixed and the new section mixed. The old section unmixed and the new section mixed. Better, certainly. But let's not think that we get the improvement without sacrifice. In processing, 
any improvement of signal to noise involves some sort of sacrifice. The snag in all this follows directly from the benefit. We have forced adjacent traces to be two-thirds the same. So if the geology is continuous, fine, we get a valid improvement. But if the geology is not continuous, we force it to be continuous, and that's dangerous. Here's another way to look at it. Let's suppose that the field setup corresponding to our near trace section is this. The first trace, the second, the third, and so on. When we add three adjacent traces in processing, therefore, it's almost as though we had a long source array in the field and a long geophone array. That is why instead of calling the process adding or mixing, we often call it array simulation. But now, we can no longer obtain a specific measure of the geology here and here and here, but only an average measure across this extent of the reflector. If there is some small geologic feature in there, a channel or small reef or a fault, then the feature becomes smeared out. We call it a loss of lateral resolution. Any attempt to improve the signal-to-noise ratio in processing involves some sacrifice. Not all processors have that straight. Only in the field can the signal-to-noise ratio be improved without any sacrifice other than cost. And not all field men have that straight. Some of them still think that anything can be fixed in the processing. It emphatically is not true. While we're talking about the field, let's remember this. When the shot goes off, the ground trembles. It doesn't just bang out and stay out, it trembles. It oscillates. On the section, the reflection likewise trembles, oscillates. And the important thing about this is that the reflection trembles, oscillates, just so fast. So we have an alternative definition of signal. Signal is that which oscillates just so fast. Noise is everything else, oscillating faster or slower. So to improve the signal-to-noise ratio in processing, filter. And by that, we mean this. The desired reflection, the signal, oscillating just so fast. The wind noise, perhaps oscillating faster. The surface waves, perhaps oscillating slower. The total noise, the sum of the two. The actual geophone output recorded on the tape, then, is the sum of all three, the signal plus all the noise. So we now apply a filter in the processing. The filter passes the signal oscillations just so fast and cuts the faster oscillations, the wind noise, and the slower oscillations, the surface waves. Thus, a filter can improve the signal-to-noise ratio in processing. Let's do it. To the previous processing chart, we add a filter. Then the previous section becomes, after filtering, this. Before filtering and after filtering. Better, the reflection's more clear, more continuous. But remember, in processing, there's always some sort of sacrifice. On the section, I don't see any sacrifice. You have to look closely, but it's there. If we look at an individual reflection on an individual trace, we can see it. The filtered reflection is even more trembly, more oscillatory than the unfiltered reflection. And that makes the reflection identification less precise. It really shows if we consider two reflections, here and here. Closely spaced, yes, but we can see them as two separate reflections. Add the noise in the field, wind and surface waves together, so that we have to filter. Apply the filter, and the two reflections now overlap, run into each other, interfere with each other, even, in part, cancel each other. So filtering works, yes, of course. But the sacrifice is that we are less able to see closely spaced reflections distinctly. Right. We call it a loss of vertical resolution. So we see, once again, that the best place to improve the signal-to-noise ratio is in the field. And one of the very best ways of doing it is multiple coverage. Remember this?
Version number one, the one we've considered all along, source and geophone fairly close together. Now, version number two. We move the shot point to the left and the geophone group to the right, but keeping the same midpoint between shot and group. Version number three. The shot to the left, the group to the right. Again, increasing the distance between shot and group, but keeping the same midpoint. Now we have three versions of the same reflection information, made with the noise observed at different times and at different places. Further, since the shot to group distances are different, the surface waves are different also. So if we add together the reflection signal obtained from this shot into this group, with that from this shot into this group, and with that from this shot into this group, we can build up our reflections and suppress both the ambient noise and the surface waves. Again, of course, you remember all that. So now we have another definition of signal and noise. Signal now is that which is common to all traces which have the same midpoint, and noise is everything else. And the processing step which goes with this definition is common midpoint stack. First of all, let's remember how we record common midpoint data in the field. In fact, the easiest way to get three versions of the reflected signal at each observation point along the line is to record six geophone groups from each shot. This is the first shot into the six groups. When that is safely recorded, we then pick up the rear group and lay it ahead beyond the far group. The second shot, with that safely recorded, we again pick up the rear group and lay it ahead. The third shot, record, pick up the rear group and lay ahead. The fourth shot, and so on. Now, if we consider any point on the reflector, say this one, we have one version of the reflection from this shot. And a second version from this shot. And a third version from this shot. The next point on the reflector has one version of the reflection from this shot. A second version from this shot and a third version from this shot. And so on for successive points on the reflector. Always three versions of the reflection, always with different distances from shot to geophone group. The three versions give us what we call multiple coverage. Again, we remember. Now let's see how all this affects the processing chart. Well, for a start, we're no longer limited to the near groups, so they come out. Further, the original tape contains the multi-group field records in the order in which they were shot. What we want for this common midpoint first is this shot into this group, followed by this shot into this group, followed by this shot into this group. We wish to gather this trace and this trace and this trace into a common midpoint family. So our processing chart must include the step gather common midpoint family and the recording of successive families on a common midpoint gather file. That's a mouthful. Is it okay if we say CMP? Sure. From now on, we'll almost always say CMP instead of common midpoint. Fine. Now, what's next? Well, having gathered our CMP families, we proceed, as before, to the mute. Same idea as before. On each trace of the gather, suppress the first arrival and ramp the trace up to full amplitude. Then, again as before, adjust the amplitudes, both by a spherical spreading correction and by a trace balancing operation, and apply the datum corrections for each trace of the gather, the appropriate source static and the appropriate receiver static. And then, at this stage, we can start the stack. This process has several parts. The first is to determine the normal move-out. 
normal move out, jargon. Let's see what it means. We consider the common midpoint gather on this midpoint. Let's say this shot into this geophone, and this shot into this geophone, and this shot into this geophone. Now we say all these paths are longer than a notional zero offset reflection path, the path we would have if it were practical to have both shot and geophone actually at the midpoint. And we ask how much longer? Let's answer it for the longest offset first. The simplest way to visualize it uses the old trick of an image of the shot in the reflector as far below the reflector as the actual shot is above it. Then, because this is the same as this, the path from shot to geophone is this. However, the path from shot to geophone at zero offset would be this. And so the difference between the long offset path and the zero offset path is this. That is, the extra distance the seismic wave must travel at the long offset relative to zero offset. So if we now draw the reflection times at a matching scale as a function of offset, here is the zero offset time for the reflection, representing this distance. The extra distance is represented by this extra time. And normal move out is this extra time. The extra reflection time introduced by an offset between shot and geophone. The importance of this is enormous. Why? Because the measurement of normal move out, the extra time corresponding to extra distance, gives us a measure of seismic velocity. Give it even more stress. Okay. When the geophone is offset from the shot, the seismic path is lengthened and the reflection time is increased. The extra distance divided by the extra time gives us the velocity. A fact which we shall use a thousand times. Okay, back to our diagram. Now let's consider the smaller offsets. For the shot here and geophone here, we have the image of the shot, the equivalent path, this being equal to this, and the extra path length for that offset. That extra path length means this extra time, the normal move out for that offset. Similarly, for the short offset, shot and geophone at this offset, we have this extra time, this normal move out. So, for the notional zero offset path, we have a corresponding notional zero offset time. And for the actual paths of a common midpoint gather, we have corresponding extra times, corresponding normal move outs. For every reflection then, we can define a zero offset time and a normal move out curve. And the normal move out curve is that rather beautiful curve, a hyperbola. Notice that for a deeper reflection, the normal move-out curve is flatter. And here it is on one real-life gather, a fairly shallow reflection showing its normal move-out curve, a deeper reflection showing its flatter normal move-out curve, always the hyperbola becoming flatter with increasing time. So, from a record such as this, we could, as we said before, measure the normal move-out as a function of time and of offset. And then, for each reflection, we subtract the appropriate amount of normal move-out from the reflection time. We move each reflection on each trace earlier by the amount of the normal move-out. Just do that again. Okay. We move each reflection on each trace earlier by the amount of the normal move-out. And here, on a real gather, before subtraction of normal move-out and after subtraction of normal move-out. Again, before subtraction of normal move-out, each reflection showing hyperbolic curvature of reflection time across the gather, and after subtraction of normal move-out, each reflection arriving at the same time across the gather. And now, since each reflection on each trace occurs at the same time, we can just add together all the traces of the gather. We can 
stack. In a common midpoint stack, then, we take all the paths of a gather and add them together to obtain a representation of the zero offset path. We take all the reflections across the gather, shift them in time, and add them together to simulate a reflection at zero offset, and so at zero offset time. All the traces of the gather compressed into one stacked trace. The stacked trace on which reflections occur at their zero offset time. And the stacked trace which shows all the improvement of signal-to-noise ratio which we would expect from adding traces with common signal and different noise. Here's the near trace section we had before, after the same processes. And here's the stacked section corresponding to it. The near trace section and the stacked section. Well, no doubt about that. A major, major improvement. As we said before, three cheers for common midpoint stacking. After stack, we can continue with the same processes we used before. Mix, if we choose. Filter. And display. Finally obtaining this. In close-up, this. Let's just run through the effect of the sequence of processes. We started with a near trace section having only the minimum processes necessary to see the reflections at all. Select the near traces, mute, and adjust amplitudes. That section we improved by datum corrections and mixing and filtering. But the biggest change came with CMP stacking. So all our current techniques, both in the field and in processing, are based on CMP stacking. A basic processing sequence is therefore likely to go like this. Gather the common midpoint families, mute the first arrivals, apply geometrical spreading corrections and possibly some statistical balancing of amplitudes, apply the datum corrections to bring both shots and geophones to the datum plane, Determine the normal move-out present on the gather as a function of offset and reflection time. Subtract the appropriate normal move-out from the reflection times on each trace of the gather. Stack all the traces of the gather to obtain one stacked trace per common midpoint. Possibly mix or simulate arrays if we're prepared to sacrifice some lateral resolution. Probably filter, if we're prepared to sacrifice some vertical resolution. Probably a final amplitude trim after all those other processes. And display. From this to this. Again, from this to this. Well, there it is, basic processing. If you look at the list of later modules, you'll see that it is only basic processing. There is a lot yet to come for the geophysicists among us. But already we see that it is worthwhile, and very much worthwhile. We are taking the signals out of the geophones, and we are manipulating them into something which begins to look like a slice through the earth. And that is what we set out to do. Only in the field can the signal-to-noise ratio be improved